Welcome to the Shoof Show. I'm your host, Christine Jackman. We are definitely fearfully and wonderfully made by our Creator. And sometimes things go wonky. Tonight's topic is type 2 diabetes. I must preface this talk by telling you that I am not a medical professional, and what I'm about to share is just my own personal experience. I've lived long enough to see that there is no one-size-fits-all or even one-size-fits-most. We are uniquely designed by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. What works for me may not work for you. Check with your doctor before making any changes. The story begins when I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes a number of years ago. My doctor at that time told me to take metformin along with two other prescriptions because metformin would adversely affect my cholesterol and blood pressure, both of which were fine. When I asked, what if I change my diet as diabetes is a dietary disease? I received a dismissive, arrogant, negative response from the doctor and the person with her. Well, I said, how long do I need to be on these three prescriptions? For the rest of your life, was the reply. The lack of option for an alternative track of treatment left me appalled. As I have lived this long without the need for any prescription drug, there was no way I was going to go on three of them without first trying the natural and logical recourse, stop eating detrimental foods. Needless to say, I found a different doctor, one that didn't poo-poo me. My new doctor suggested that I test my blood sugar one and a half to two hours after eating to discover what foods spiked my blood sugar, and it worked. For the last year, I have been weaning blood spiker foods out of my diet. The first obvious things to delete from my diet were sugar, processed foods, and fast foods. I began making my own salad dressings, like balsamic dressing, my own soups, etc. I switched to good fats, olive oil, organic butter, good kosher meats, lactose-free milk, sheep's milk feta, and sheep milk yogurt. And about two months ago, I also cut out all grains, no rice, no corn, no wheat, etc. With these changes, I found that my acid reflux problem virtually disappeared. Now I hardly ever need Tums. That's good news, as this problem had been interfering with my throat and singing abilities. When I quit the grains, my brain fog cleared up, and I had tons more energy. No more nodding off after eating. My nightly sleep is even getting better. I'm dreaming again. And I'm experiencing more weight loss. Recently, I had my yearly doctor visit. The test results came in, and ta-da! My A1C has gone down from 7.5 to, drumroll please, 6.1. Yes, from 7.5 to 6.1. Thank you, Lord. Today, I designed my meals to be balanced with quality protein, good fats, lower-carb veggies, and fruits. The fats will help keep down the insulin spikes. I look for healthy kosher meats, wild-caught salmon, cold-pressed olive oil and organic butter, lots of above-ground veggies, limited root veggies like beets, carrots, purple potatoes, onions, garlic, leeks, that type of thing. Also, I can tolerate aged sharp cheeses, sheep's milk feta, and lactose-free milk and plain lactose-free kefir, too. Currently, I'm experimenting with growing a few herbs and veggies in my tiny condo garden. Someday, when I can afford it, my dream is to get a little house in the country with a room for a sunny garden and woods to walk in. Alarmingly, industrially grown produce is not as nutritious as it was 50 years ago or so. Haven't you noticed that the tomatoes you buy in the store barely taste like a tomato? Or melons are so bland that you wonder why you bother buying them at all? I remember the gardens of my youth. Younger people today have no idea how much flavor is missing from current veggies. Today's vegetables often offer bland flavor, lower nutrition, sometimes even up to 50% less vitamins and minerals. Oh, but my goodness, they look so pretty sitting on that store shelf and they'll survive the apocalypse. Enough. It's time to get back to growing vegetables that are nutritious. My plan, Lord willing, is to buy true heirloom seed varieties, grow my own food in healthy soil, learn how to preserve the harvest and save seeds. 
you'll be amazed at how much of your own food you can grow in just a small backyard garden. Here's the cool thing. It is such a wonderful feeling to eat what you yourself have grown. You know exactly where it came from. Personally, when I'm working in the garden, I feel closer to our Creator, observing and cooperating with the miracle of our created world. Which brings me to the commandment to let the land rest every seven years. I can't wait to put that one into practice. It's called the Shemitah. In Hebrew, that means literally release. It is a year of faith, a year of release. According to the terms of the covenant in Leviticus 25, every seven years, debts are canceled and the land is to rest. Let's read what the Lord commands. We're looking at Leviticus 25, and I'll read 1 through 7, 18 through 22. But feel free, go ahead and read the whole shebang. yud heh vav or I'll just say Hashem, which is Hebrew for the name. Hashem then spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I shall give you, then the land shall have a Shabbat to Hashem. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its crop. But during the seventh year the land will have a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to Hashem. You shall not sow your field nor prune your vineyard. Your harvest after growth you shall not reap. The grapes of your untrimmed vines you shall not gather. The land will have a sabbatical year. All of you shall have a Sabbath of the land for food, yourselves and your male and female servants, your hired man, your foreign resident, those who live as sojourners with you. Even your cattle and your animals that are in your land shall have all of its crops to eat. Dropping down to verse 18. You shall thus observe my statutes and keep my judgment, so as to carry them out, that you may live securely on the land. Then the land will yield its produce so that you can eat your fill and live securely on it. But if you say, what are we going to eat on the seventh year if we do not sow or gather in our crops? Then I will so order my blessing for you in the sixth year that it will bring forth the crop for three years. When you are sowing the eighth year, you can still eat the old things from the crop, eating the old until the ninth year when the crop comes in. End quote. Yes, the Shemitah year is a year of faith. It's important. God is serious about the Shemitah. Remember how House of Judah went into Babylonian exile for 70 years? Why? They were unfaithful to the terms of the ancient covenant, including not letting the land lay fallow every seven years. One year in exile for every Shemitah land rest they ignored. They had been warned. Many years before, Moses, Moshe, prophesied regarding this in Vayikra, Leviticus 26, verses 33 through 35. Here's what Moshe prophesied. Quote, You, however, I will scatter among the nations and will draw out a sword after you as your land becomes desolate and your cities become waste. Then the land will enjoy its Sabbaths all the days of the desolation while you are in your enemy's land. Then the land will rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. All the days of its desolation it will observe the rest, which it did not observe on your Sabbaths when you were living on it. Now here, look what Jeremiah says. His prophecy, Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah 25, verse 11. This whole land will be a desolation and a horror, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. End quote. Now those are the prophecies. Let's look at the fulfillment um, look at Second Chronicles 36, verses 20 through 21. Quote, he carried into exile to Babylon the remnant who escaped from the sword, and they became, they became servants to him and his successors until the kingdom of Persia came to power. The land enjoyed its Sabbath rests. All the time of its desolation it rested until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word of Hashem spoken by Jeremiah. Then also look at Daniel 9, verses 2 through 3. Quote, In the first year of his reign, talking about Darius here, the Persian guy, I, Daniel, 
observed in the scrolls the number of the years which was revealed as the word of Hashem to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So I gave my attention to Hashem Elohim to seek him by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. End quote. God is serious about letting the land lay fallow every seven years. We have ignored this practice in the world at large. Remember, Israel was designated as firstborn of the nations. Her ultimate destiny is to teach the whole world how to come back to our Creator through Messiah Yeshua, back into covenant relation and the holy lifestyle. After all, there is only one God, and He will have order in His house, not chaos. Although today Israel is largely quite worldly, the day will come when she will live up to her calling. Remember this prophecy, Zechariah, Zechariah 8, 22 through 23, quote, So many peoples and mighty nations will come to seek Hashem of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of Hashem. Thus says Hashem of hosts, In those days, ten men from all languages of the nations will grasp the corner of the garment of a man, a Jew, Ish Yehudi, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. <sighs> Ratio of ten to one. Pray, seek the peace of Jerusalem, people. There have been stories coming out of Israel from those who keep the Shemitah, letting their land lay fallow in the seventh year, experiencing miraculous things. Here's a couple examples. From the Jerusalem Post, this is back from 2008, quote, In what some potato farmers in the Negev are taking as a sign from God, the recent frost that ravaged produce across the nation selectively passed over some crops, as if guided, they say, by a divine hand. Potatoes planted in the Negev before the beginning of the Shemitah, the sab sabbatical year, in accordance with the biblical prohibition against plowing, sowing, and many other field chores, were spared the damages caused by sharp drops in temperature last week. In contrast, potatoes that were planted during the Shemitah year, which began at nightfall on September 13, the first day of the Jewish year of 5768, were decimated. End quote. And here's another, uh, another account. It's called the Miracle Banana Field. Quote, a completely secular farmer whose produces bananas decided that he would undertake to keep the Shemitah. This time around, when he approached the Karen Hashivis, the organization that helps facilitate this, for existence, they stipulated that he would be registered in the program if he would also undertake to be personally Shomer Shabbos, Sabbath observant throughout the Shemitah. He agreed. Israel has suffered a significant cold spell over that winter for two to three weeks. Bananas do not like cold, and cold doesn't like bananas. Needless to say, they don't get along. When the bananas are still growing, get hit with frost, they turn brown and become rock-solid hard. The hero of our story, Gibor Koach, the banana farmer, knew he was in deep trouble when the relentless cold hadn't left, let up for a week. He lived a distance from his orchard and hadn't yet seen the damage with his own eyes. He began to receive calls from his neighbor farmers who have orchards bordering his, complaining bitterly that their entire banana crop had been destroyed by the frost. He decided it was time to inspect the damage up close, no matter how painful it may be. He drove up close to Tiberias to inspect his orchard, as well as those from his neighboring farmers. As he passed from one orchard to another, he was overwhelmed by the damage. Not a single fruit had survived. No tree was spared. His neighbors took quite a beating. All the bananas were brown, hard as a rock. He could only imagine how bad his trees must have gotten it. Yet when he finally got to his orchard, he was awestruck. All of his bananas were yellow and green. It's as if his orchard was not part of this parcel of land. His orchard bordered those of his neighbors, but not a single tree of his was struck by the frost. It's as if a protective wall kept the damage away. At first, he thought he was imagining it as he rushed from one section of his orchard to another. The realization that more than the farmer keeps the Shemitah, the Shemitah keeps the farmer, held it, that hit home. He immediately called his contacts at KS and yelled into the phone, 
Kara Ness, Kara Ness, a miracle happened, a miracle happened. A miraculous modern-day manifestation of Vetsivisi et Habracha. I will ordain my blessing for you in the sixth year. There is no way to explain this other than Hashem keeps his promises. He says, keep Shemitah and I'll take care of you. He sure does. KS reports that farmers that had until now refused to keep Shemitah have been turning to KS following the losses suffered from the result of the frost. They are now ready to commit to the Shemitah observance, end quote. The other aspect of the Shemitah is the canceling of debts every seven years. Remember, the biblical Hebrew word Shemitah means release. Can you imagine? No going into debt for a 30-year house mortgage. Finances will revolve around a seven-year debt cycle. If you want to know how to set up a nation, look to the scriptures to see how God designed government and daily life in the nation of Israel. She is the city on a hill. When Messiah returns, the written Torah will be the rule of law. God does not change his mind, and he does not change his laws. He doesn't need to. How great is our God. He is amazing. Thank you, Lord, for being who you are. Please continue to grant us your teacher, the Ruach HaKodesh, the spirit of holiness, and guide us in your everlasting ways. This has been the Shuv Show. Shuv is a biblical Hebrew word that means to return, to turn around, to repent, to come back to the God of the Bible and his good rules. I'm your host, Christine Jackman. Lila Tov. Good night.